Okay, good morning. Uh, thanks to Dr. Erdos for um, inviting me and for organising this conference. Um, and it's a real pleasure to, to be back um, at Cambridge for, for the day. Um, I've been asked this morning to talk about uh, the jurisprudence of the Court of Justice uh, in the lead up to, um, or as a background to, the Google Spain case. Um, there has been remarkably little case law uh, in front of the Court of Justice dealing with data protection issues, despite the fact that we've had uh, the Data Protection Directive for almost two decades. Um, but rather than kind of going case by case through the jurisprudence, which might be a little dry for the morning slot, um, what I've um, instead tried to do is to demonstrate that the case law prior to Google Spain is entirely consistent uh, with the court's findings in the Google Spain judgment. And I say this uh, for three reasons. So I guess the subtext here is the reasons why we should have seen Google Spain coming. Um, and I think that's for three reasons. Um, so first of all, the court has continuously insisted upon the broad scope of application of the data protection rules. And that's something that is reflected in the Google Spain judgment. And you see that through, for instance, the broad scope of territorial application, which the court gives to the Data Protection Directive in that case, where it says that um, Google search engine processing is in the context of the advertising activities of its Spanish subsidiary. So broad scope of territorial application there, something which the Advocate General was, was in agreement with. Um, but then also you see that the, this broad scope of application is reflected in, in other ways, which I'll, I'll go on to talk about. The second point, which I think um, is quite evident, is that despite a slow start, um, the court is now placing increasing emphasis on the EU Charter, and in particular on the EU Charter's rights to data protection and to privacy. So unlike other international instruments, the EU Charter includes both um, a right to privacy in Article 7 and a right to data <coughs> protection in Article 8. And the court has been quite forthcoming now in emphasising the effectiveness of those rights. And then the third point um, I think we could uh, adduce in order to, to support the Google Spain finding, for good or for bad, is that the court at present seems to be quite um, emboldened. It has taken several judgments um, which illustrate that it is not, in my opinion, entirely concerned about the political fallout that will follow from um, its decisions. So I'll elaborate on uh, these three points now. So first of all, if we take the broad scope of application of the data protection rules, here I think you can see that um, the directive has a broad personal scope in terms of how we define who is a data subject, and also, as we saw in Google Spain, who is a data controller. So in that case, the Advocate General had argued that um, in order to be viewed as a data controller, so an entity, a company, which would be responsible um, or have obligations pursuant to the data protection rules, there should be a knowledge that the company concerned is processing, I say company could also be a local authority, the entity concerned, um, there should be a knowledge that there, that there is processing of personal data. Now, a literal interpretation of the directive doesn't include that knowledge um, criterion, and actually the court rejected the idea that a data controller has to have knowledge that they are processing personal data in order to um, have obligations pursuant to the directive. Now, Google here might have been quite a particular case, but I think if you look to um, the, the kind of broader issue of the application of data protection rules, that's actually quite a sensible finding, because in the absence of that finding, companies could plead um, ignorance, so ignorance of the fact that they are processing personal data in order to escape obligations um, pursuant to the data protection rules. But you see there that the court is defensive of the broad um, personal application of the data protection rules. You also have broad um, material scope of the rules. So um, here, data processing is pretty much anything that you could do with personal data. And personal data is any information relating to an identified or identifiable person. Now, Jeff has just spoken about um, identifiability and, and the issue of, kind of public and private in the context of things like anonymization. 
But I think it's important to highlight here that that definition of personal data goes beyond um, the type of data that might be covered by the, the, the Article 8 ECHR right to privacy. It's a very broad um, definition. So we have this, we have this very broad um, scope of application of the data protection rules. And as I've just said, unlike the right to privacy in certain contexts, this will always apply to material in the public domain. This is irrespective of whether or not the information is publicly available or not. And this broad scope of application has been defended by the court in its case law. So it's very protective of the, the directive scope of application. So I've just indicated a couple of cases here, but in a case like Schwartz, what was concerned was the fingerprinting data of a German national. He was obliged to provide this fingerprint data in order to obtain a passport um, from his local authority in, well, through the German government uh, at home. And he objected to this on the grounds that it was unnecessary data processing. And the court recognised without hesitation that this type of data, which would also benefit from the right to privacy, constitutes personal data from, uh, or in the context of the directive. A more complicated case, you might say, um, is Bavarian Lager. And there you had um, a, a query about access to minutes of a meeting between um, industry representative and European Commission officials. And the Commission was refusing to grant access to the minutes of this meeting on the grounds that the names of the industry representatives constituted personal data. Um, and here, before the courts, so between the Court of First Instance at the time, um, the Advocate General and the Court of Justice, there was a dispute about whether or not um, those industry representative names could benefit from the right to privacy. Because although there's a right to privacy in the workplace, here it doesn't seem to sit very well with the reasonable expectation of privacy, um, given that the access was sought under transparency regulations at EU level and equally um, with the kind of rationale for privacy in the workplace, which is to allow individuals to develop relations. And clearly the whole aim of transparency legislation is to prevent cosy uh, relationships between commission officials and industry representatives. So this might not have been covered by the right to privacy, but it clearly fell within the scope of the right to data protection and of data protection legislation. So you can see again a broad scope. And then I think the most uh, recent notable case, and this is a case from last December, where the court was asked to consider whether or not um, the exception to the, to the scope of the data protection rules, which is an exception for personal data, which is, are processed for purely personal or household purposes, um, could be applied to the case of Mr. Mr. Renus. And uh, Mr. Renus was... Um, uh, an individual who had installed a form of closed circuit TV outside of his front door because his family home had been subject to numerous attacks in the past. Um, so this camera was installed for personal security purposes and it captured the pathway up to his, his front door but it also captured part of the public path outside <laughs> of his front door. And um, this this camera ca um, happened to capture some footage relating to an attack on his house. And the footage was um, brought forward to be used in the proceedings against the perpetrators. And um, the question was raised as to whether or not that footage could be used because um, Mr. Renus hadn't kind of received prior authorization for the processing and hadn't complied with his obligations as a data controller. So was the capture of this footage compatible with data protection law? And he argued um, that the processing in this instance was for purely personal or household reasons. Um, he wasn't, the, the footage wasn't um, automatically recorded over itself. It wasn't retained. He didn't have a way to, to live, um, to examine the footage, footage remotely on a phone or anything else. Um, and yet the court found that in this instance, um, the footage was not purely personal because it captured a public pavement. So you see there that that's a remarkably broad interpretation um, of the purely, uh, sorry, remarkably narrow even, interpretation of the purely household um, and personal processing exception in order to preserve the broad scope of application of the rules.
But in that case, the court was kind of at pains to emphasize that just because you fall within the scope of the data protection rules doesn't mean that the processing is unlawful. Rather, at that point, once you're within the, the fold of the rules, um, there's a system of checks and balances which um, determines whether or not the processing can be lawful in any particular circumstance. So you have a very strong indication from the court there that Mr. Renus would have been able to justify this processing um, and that it would have, would have been adequate. So we have the broad scope of application, which is reflected in Google Spain. We also have an increased emphasis on the effectiveness of the EU Charter rights. So I would argue that in the, in the early years, prior to the Charter um, acquiring binding force or becoming a judici uh, justiciable instrument in 2009, there was an initial reluctance on the court to point to um, the Charter right to privacy in order to, um, in order to justify its actions in any given case. And I think this is particularly um, the kind of narrow interpretation of privacy or of the directive is particularly visible in a case like SATA Media. Um, so in that case, you had um, an issue about whether or not um, data on high earners, um, so those who are earning over 100,000 euro a year, could be disseminated via text message by a private private company. And there, the private company had pleaded that this um, this dissemination could benefit from the directive's exemption for processing for journalistic purposes. So the argument was the text message dissemination is journalistic um, and therefore can fall outside the scope of the data protection rules. And there the court gave, um, the court interpreted that exception, the journalistic purposes exception, really broadly. So it said that um, it, it, it applies to the disclosure of information, ideas, or opinions to the public. Fast forward to last year, and you can see that clearly um, the definition of journalistic purposes has changed significantly when it comes to the Google Spain case. So we have seen, I believe, a, a, change, in, a change in tack when it comes to what could benefit from this exemption for journalistic purposes. Um, finally, um, I think in addition to that change in tack, there's perhaps in the court's case law um, an indifference to the disconnect between law, it's maybe a bit harsh to call it reality, but certainly technological developments. And that you know, is one of the big um, criticisms of the Google Spain case. That's also a criticism of the, the Lindqvist case, where the court seemed to have kind of mixed feelings about how the directive should apply to um, the internet. So on the one hand, it held that um, the act of a, of a um, pensioner who was uploading data um, about to, to a charitable website um, for personal purposes as part of her data processing course um, could be criminally prosecuted for that action. Um, because it was personal data processing, because she uploaded information on her um, on her colleagues uh, to the internet. But on the other hand, it, it kind of stopped short of saying that she should have been responsible for international data transfers. So you can see that the court has clearly kind of struggled um, to apply this old directive to, to new um, circumstances. And then finally. Um, I think you see um, at the moment an. Uh, a stronger court, particularly when it comes to fundamental rights. Um, so this is perhaps because of, as I said, the introduction of the Charter, the Charter's acquisition of binding force in 2009. Um, but that was very visible in last year's judgment in Digital Rights Ireland. Um, the court, for the first time, um, struck down an entire piece of legislation on the basis that it was not compatible <coughs> with um, the EU Charter rights. And in so doing, it ignored the Advocate General's request that that judgment have a temporal limitation, which would allow member states to put in place safeguards for, well, safeguards may be the wrong word, um, arrangements for data retention um, while, uh, while a new directive would be enacted. So it ignored that. Um, but equally, I think if you look at something like opinion two of, um, two of 2013, which was where the court was asked to assess um, the legality of the European Union's accession agreement to the ECHR with EU law, 
And it argued or it found that that accession agreement to the ECHR was incompatible with EU law. Um, in an incredibly kind of complicated judgment, which I, I think could be kind of narrowly read, um, but it, it is effectively it said that by signing up to the ECHR as the agreement stands, um, it would be circumventing things like the preliminary reference procedure before, before the court. So again, clearly a case where it wasn't too concerned about the political implications of um, its findings. And then finally, this week before the Court of Justice, we had um, the, the hearing in the Schrems case, um, which was a preliminary reference from the Irish High Court, where the compatibility of the um, safe harbour principles, um, so allowing data transfers between the EU and the US, was challenged on the basis that those principles, which were adopted in the year 2000, um, no longer reflected a situation um, where adequate protection was being offered to EU citizens when their data are transferred um, to the US as a result of the Snowden revelations. And um, there, I, I believe, from anything I've, I've read or um, heard about the proceedings, they were, they were quite lively and that the Commission was more or less left on the back Back, I think I can say this, left on the back foot um, in arguing that in order to effectively protect fundamental rights, individuals should possibly not sign up to Facebook. Um, and so we, we'll, it remains to be seen um, what will happen with that judgment. The opinion of the Advocate General is due on the, the 24th of um, June. But I would say, based on what we've seen so far, the ingredients would indicate that um, TREMS has a good chance of, of succeeding in that case. Um, I'll leave it there, but uh, hope to discuss further during questions.